we're here at the CSEP National Conference. Airwave has brought me out. If there's a way that you can improve your strength very easily, Airwave is the way. I'm speaking this morning to everybody uh, about exercise, my story, and everything there. So CSEP is one of the few organizations in Canada that allows you to work with people with unique and complicated situations. You guys know that that's a big passion of mine. It's also the only credential in which you can work with the Olympic teams and the Paralympic teams in Canada. Uh, so really good work and it's cool. I have a lot of my professors here from back when I was at uni. Uh, and yeah, um, we'll see what all goes. We're gonna take a look at some of the booths because there's a whole lot of cool and interesting nerdy science stuff. So if you guys wanna learn a little bit more, keep watching. This type of stuff I nerd out about in terms of like, I assume you go into um, energy utilization and substrate utilization, total energy expenditure, how that modifies with um, exercise. So um, I would love for you just to explain a little bit. Do we have the other mic? What we do is essentially measuring metabolic cart stuff yep. in a mobile solution, right? So that's the uh, Metamax 580 grams. This is totally mobile. Yes. Wow, okay, right. White device equipped with an external battery it lasts for six hours plus. We have a GPS on it and we are doing breath by breath analysis. So yeah. your main outcome that people usually are familiar with is oxygen uptake, CO2 output and ventilation. Yeah. Those are the three core parameters. Yeah. Based on this, we can then draw conclusions. For example, in a lab based scenario, we could then provide exercise prescription based on these thresholds that we find for any type of athlete, depending sure. on what you want to do. Talk about, talk about the ventilation threshold. I think people find that interesting. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, in spirogometry or CPET or pulmonary exercise testing, there are different thresholds that we can assess. Mm -hmm. So the first ventilatory threshold, formerly known as the anaerobic threshold, mm -hmm. this is where things become interesting throughout a test because this is basically the onset of lactic acid production. Yeah. So where the amount of lactic acid production increases the amount of eliminated lactic acid in the bloodstream. Yeah. So it will increase significantly. We measure exact, essentially we measure the, uh, the same thing, just at a different position. So yeah. lactate, you draw blood with spirogometry we measure at the end of the day what comes out if you burn a certain substrate yes so we know that if you burn carbohydrates c6h12o6 it yep. turns into co2 and water yep and energy obviously right mm -hmm. so if your respiratory exchange ratio is at a certain point we can then draw a conclusion whether you're burning fat or carbohydrate yeah now that usually <clears throat> falls together with the first ventilatory threshold quite nicely. So when we see that the fat metabolism starts to break down is when we usually pass through the first ventilatory threshold. Yeah. Now, why is that interesting? You don't strike me as the, anaero uh, as the aerobic long distance runner, right? It used but to be. <laughs> I've run three marathons. Oh yeah, good, I used good to on you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Now, um, when you. When you want to train for any sort of endurance sports, for game sports, for any, anything that requires longer amounts of exercise, um, than just a sprint, yep. you'd benefit from knowing where your first ventilatory threshold is positioned because you would, sooner or later you'd be doing distance running, uh -huh. depending on how long and, and how intense. Uh -huh. Based on these thresholds, we can now prescribe exercise. And when you talk about the first ventilatory threshold, we're talking this guy? Yes, the first ventilatory, no, um, that's just a marker. Um, the first ventilatory threshold we would assess, that's the green line that you can see here. I can blow that up to full screen. So. In this case, you see the fat metabolism breaking down is uh -huh. usually where you find your first ventilatory threshold, roughly. However, mm -hmm. the proper way of assessing, because that's more to validate your threshold, is via the fat metabolism. Yep. You would determine your threshold based on the so-called V-slope method of Peter Hansen Wasserman. Uh -huh. Right. So we're looking at an onset of excess CO2 in the in the um, breathing stream. So yeah. what we can pick up is as soon as you start building up lactic acid, you would see a change of slope in the comparison of CO2 output and oxygen uptake. That's the yeah. slope method. So the change of slope right here. Yes, Basically correct. that this is when the hyperventilation starts trying to get the excess CO2 out because your distribution of burning carbohydrates is much higher. Yes. Now in the guided evaluation, you would then see sort of the analysis, how much percent of your predicted values were you able to cover or how much percent were you able to cover yeah. of your own reached VO2. Yeah. That's basically the interpretation of how much of your performance can you cover without becoming anaerobic. 
sure. obviously for long slow distance, uh, sorry, for long distance runners, triathletes, cyclists, this number has to be as high as possible. Yeah. Because that's what they do all day. They sit on the bike for six hours, right? Yeah. It's no good if they do that at 40% and then become yeah. anaerobic. Yeah, yeah, yeah Sooner course. or later, they will You're be done. very sitting and they stop. <laughs> of course. Right? <laughs> and the Tour de France stage is quite long. That's very, very cool. Nice. Yeah. Thank you very much you for like that. It. Hey, no yeah, I appreciate you. Great okay, so we yeah, are Delsus. We are an electromyography company. We make sensors to look at the muscle activation for those superficial muscles that you have on. So I have oh, EMG amazing. sensors on right now. Oh, okay, I'm with you. Um, so that the green trace is the electromyography current that is coming through my muscle. Yeah. And then on board of all of our sensors, we have a full IMU um, chip, which gives you three channels of acceleration yeah. in three directions and three channels of gyroscope in three directions. So they're able to give you some um, joint and angular velocity there. Do you have spare EMG electrodes? Yes, we do. Can we chuck a couple on? Sure. I would love to, because one of the things that I love is when people are debating uh, high bar squat or low bar squat or hack squat, or right. I want to show the difference in hamstring activation on a deadlift versus a squat when we actually perform the movement with EMG on. For people who don't know, when you contract a muscle, there's an electrical current that runs through. This measures the electrical current. In research, they'll often regulate it to 100% maximum voluntary contraction. So you can see here, as I move my leg, you can see these lines jumping up and down. And when I relax, it's steady straight out. So, different movements, let's see where we're at. We'll start with we'll start with a normal squat so interesting come look at this close you can see the only time the hamstring is hugely active is when i start the squat and when i finish the squat so it's the deceleration of my knee extension and initiating the movement but if I sit at the bottom of the squat, there's not a whole lot. Oh, we got a different screen now. There's not a whole lot of activity going on when I'm hanging out. And then when I stand up, the only bump you see is when I'm at that final stage of standing up, when I stop myself from hyperextending my knee. Okay. Now, split squat, if we go real wide, again, it's gonna show nothing when we're steady. And really, not a whole lot going on. Now, this would probably change if we put electrode up towards the proximal hamstring because it's very hip dominant. If we're going closer, I'm gonna guess that this is gonna mimic the squats that we were just doing. So you can see, it only wants to go very early and very late in the movement, controlling, whew, controlling the knee flexion. Amazing. And then if we go to deadlift, okay, you can see as a percentage of maximum, there ain't a whole lot happening because deadlift is so proximal dominant. But if we had something somewhat heavy, now hamstring will have to start doing work. And there you go. So this is the stuff I always talk about when we talk about distribution of effort for different muscles. If you change the technique slightly, you can see the muscle activation just goes off the charts. So say you're working up to one rep max, your technique changes slightly. When we talk about progressive overload, two to 5% a week, if you change your technique, you might be overloading your hamstring 20, 25, 30%. So you gotta be really careful. And there's the evidence. Very cool. I love that. I just wanted to ask you about uh, your deload cycle. You say, was it, did, did I get it correct? You said every four to five weeks? Four to six, yeah. Four to six weeks? Yeah, that's what I tried. Yeah. And, and uh, what's the science behind that? Like, do you train, and you said you don't train to the get sore? Is that like? I just don't get sore because total workout volume is so low. Okay. Right, you, do so, five, you do five singles at 300 kilos, you have 1,500 units of effort. Right. If you do a one by 10, at 200 kilos, you've got 2,000. Right. But the, the effort would be dramatically different. Right. Where it takes so much effort to build volume when you talk about high intensity work and low rep work. Right. That it really doesn't get you, it doesn't damage your muscles the same. Now the science behind deload is twofold. One is 
Uh, sympathetic nervous system can only take so much pushing before you have to pull it back. The second is since our soft tissues don't have the blood supply that our active tissues have, they uh, they recover much slower. And that's like the ligaments and tendons. Ligament, tendon, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, cartilage, meniscus, okay. discs, mm -hmm. all of that. And so they need time to catch up. So you might feel good, you might feel strong, but if you get the discrepancy between your active tissue and your soft tissue too far, you're gonna run into problems. Right, so that, just from experience, like four to six weeks, Work up yeah, and it depends. It depends speed. on your exercise level, on your how close you are to your genetic potential, the absolute amount that you're lifting, your fitness level, your life stress, your sleep, right. your your nutrition. It, it really is an individual thing at that stage, yep. but it does have to be at some point just dealer. So, what would you recommend for like a weekend warrior, someone's just training to get maintain a decent shape, but still want to make gains year over year? Yeah, but kind of want to go and you know do a obstacle course race once yeah. in the summer or? Well, I think their deload is when they go on vacation. Their deload is when they were sick and took a week off the gym. Right. They're probably not working as consistent and as hard as you would need to actually burn your nervous system to push your body to the limits. Right. So it's actually not a bad thing that, you know, you. You fall off the wagon for a week or two. It's actually beneficial for everybody. I would You're say training so, consistently. So long as it's structured and part of the plan, I don't see a problem with it. Yeah. And for deload weeks, like, okay, you're on vacation and you're not at the gym, you gotta go for a walk. You know, just like basic movement, but not working your body super hard. Right. That makes sense. Thank you very much. Sure. Of course. So All Greg right, just yeah, uh, broke my heart and told me 30% body fat. We're gonna vet it. And uh, we're with InBody, and we're gonna see if maybe via electro electricity pass through my hands and feet, see if that gives us a more favorable result. Do you wanna talk just like broad strokes about the technology for people who don't know? I was just gonna say bioelectrical impedance. Mm -hmm. So it is multiple frequencies. It is an electrical current that runs through the body. So it's safe to use provided that you don't have a heart condition or a pacemaker. So you okay. don't? No. Okay, and are you currently pregnant? Um, yes, but my wife is carrying the baby. Okay, okay, well then that's all right. <laughs> so let's say, just looking at me, if you had to guess, give me, give me predicted body fat and predicted weight of muscle. Ooh, I don't know. Um, I'm gonna say you're definitely off the charts for the muscle, yeah. um, but I don't know, body fat percentage will be interesting. So I'll give you, my body weight is about 325. Okay. What do you think muscle reading? Give us a guess. You guys give us a guess. Let us know yeah. what you think. What do you think? You gotta give us something. Let's go 189. 189. Yes. Because you gotta remember, water is a, your water has to be 50 to 65 percent of your weight as well too. Okay. So we don't want to be too high in muscle. 189. We'll go with that. Let's see. <laughs> okay. So heels as best as you can on the back electrodes, yep. and then we'll adjust you afterwards. Stand still. It will measure your weight. So our machines are rated to over 500 pounds. Okay. So that's good. Just be respectful. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. 321. Stop moving around. <laughs> Feet are good. We're going to grab the handles Moment like a wheelbarrow. Moment of truth. So thumbs on top. Straighten the arms and then away from the body so that we make sure we have a break from the arm to the trunk. Okay, sub 10%. Oh, yes. Greg. Oh, printed report. Greg. Your caliper skills are being put on blast at the moment. <laughs> All right, did you want to come in closer and take All a look right. at this report? Moment of truth. All right, so here's your weight. Now we know what we weigh. What does that break down into? So your lean body mass, so muscle and water, everything minus fat is 256 pounds. So your cool. lean body mass was, I said 189, if we were gonna go with water, right? Your water is 186. Again, think wow. back to World Health Organization, we should be 50 to 65% water. Wow. Um, because muscle is water, 73% water. Now sure. granted, it's midday, so you've consumed, you've had probably coffee, uh, food, so water levels can be hit and miss on that. Mm -hmm. Uh, intracellular water is water inside the cells, healthy cells, healthy muscles. Uh -huh. And then we have water extracellular. Again, we need a good balance of a three to two ratio. So too much extracellular water can cause for inflammation. So then what you want to do is kind of come down here to this part, which is the extracellular water versus your total body water analysis. And you're sitting in that healthy average. So cool. no concerns there. Amazing. I mean, we can see that up top because it's bigger intracellular than extracellular. Yep. Uh, your dry lean mass. So if we were to shrivel you up like a prune, you'd be 69 pounds of dry lean mass. What's the highest you've ever seen? 
I would probably say this is the highest I've it ever has seen. To be, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then body fat mass is 64 pounds. 64.9. 65 pounds. Yeah. 65 sticks of butter spread on my lean marbled body. Shame. But <laughs> but moment of truth. Yep. What does it check out to? Right, so then your body fat percentage is 20%. So you are in that healthy average. Men should be 10 to 20%. Your 20% body fat percentage at noon. Greg, so. we're looking at you, Greg. Could you for the camera just say, Greg, you're full Greg, of shit. what he said. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. What do you well, think? Thank you so much. I'm very, very pleased with 20%. That's a 10% improvement from what I was told before. We are taking it. Give it another six months. We'll be at 10% in another six months, and I'll see you at the Olympia.